thank you so much. Um, the chair forgot the most important part of my CV. I have a granddaughter. <laughs> and she is five years old. She is living in San Francisco. And nearby every weekend we are Skyping. And a couple of months ago, she said, uh, Nay, nay, um, we are not on the same page. And I said, pardon me. And she said, well, I have my own principles and you have yours. And I said, well, can we bridge that gap? And she said, no, you are too old for it. But it is nice to talk to you. <laughs> and, and that is on a very small scale talking about the subject that we are touching upon today. Giving freedom of um, speech, having pluralism, and having opportunities to discuss it. And that Europe is a home for. It is a home for democracy, it's a home for transparency, and it is a home for fundamental rights. And those three issues are quite important for the rest of my remarks. We know that a free and a pluralistic media is essential, is an essential part of that. But, and that is of course the key question, how to ensure? How to ensure respect for those values in practice and it's less obvious than just the line to explain it. And that is where I seek a debate. And therefore, Chair, I think this is for me anyhow an historical day for it is not the start of the discussion, we are aware. But this is the day that we will just ask for consultation of the high-level group's report and of the re report of Christian Van Tilo talking about the business models and the media um, uh, future. So when I am looking for a debate with you, I want to know what are your ideas. And I'm very glad that Peter uh, Rabbit, the minister, and I are here together this morning. Pat, sorry, uh, uh, are here together. And it shows that the Irish presidency is as committed as we are to drive this debate with you. And Pat and I discussed it before, and we are determined to get it in a speedy way and find a way forward. By the way, that's no surprise. As we speak in a city, uh, that knows the value of freedom and long struggles for it. There are three points, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to make today. Number one, in the European Union, we do face challenges, and I'm using diplomatic terms, sometimes even threats to our principles. By international comparison, Europe does relatively well in this area. Most EU citizens thankfully enjoy the benefits of a free and a pluralistic media. But that doesn't mean that there are no problems, whether of media concentration, lack of diversity, of restrictions on online, but also <laughs> offline media, or state control, pressure and interference. Hungary has been one high profile case, and there are issues of media freedom are not yet solved, just pure are not yet solved. Only a fraction of the Council of Europe's recommendations have been implemented. And I welcome, of course, I'm counting my blessings, even if they are small. I welcome that Club Radio has finally received a disputed frequency after an extremely long and complex legal battle. But media issues, are not limited to one member state. There are concerns and intense debates in places across the EU. From concerns about excessive concentration of media ownership, lack of transparency, just naming Bulgaria, to the UK, Levinson inquiry on the press, but David will certainly uh, explain that, uh, where the rights and responsibilities of journalists to abide by the law were tested and found severely wanting in many instances. The scale and the issues are not always the same, that's clear. But this is a debate that rages across the Union. And this is an issue we must fix in Europe. We are the birthplace of democracy, 
a global guardian of fundamental rights. And we are losing our rights outside the European Union if we are not getting our own house in order. I remember my discussions in Baku that people were saying, come on, you have a point. Yes, when I was touching upon their freedom of speech and pluralism. But what about, and then you are feel like this, so to say. So we must fix in Europe what has to be fixed. If Europe <coughs> is to be anything more than an economic union, it should be as a model and a champion of those values. For it is, of course, very important that we just solve all the problems in the financial economic uh, area with the difficulties, but our values are the base of our being together. So to safeguard those values for our own citizens and to promote them to the planet, and let's be the global best in class, the freest, the proudest media in the world. And my second point is, how do we achieve that? Because there are many different views about the best instruments to use whether there should be intervention by lawmakers or self-regulation by the sector or something in between, whether it should be EU or national action, or perhaps it's not about the rules and regulations at all, but about the climate in which they operate and are interpreted. A climate of professionalism by and respect for a free media and I want to make a contribution to resolve those issues in a dialogue with you in a way that transcends particular cases and transcends party politics. What is at stake is citizens' right to free expression and the right to benefit from free expression by others. Think of my granddaughter. She was teaching me it is my right and it's your right to have different opinions. Party politics should not stand in the way. And of course, you all say, for you are the decent part of Europe. Of course, it shouldn't be a party politic uh, issue. But Pat and I can just um, explain to you that's not always the case. Sometimes party politics, and also in these issues in Europe, are playing a big role. And it shouldn't. What is at stake? Indeed, citizens' right to free expression. So, too often, politicians in Brussels seem to have pulled their punches on what is happening in one or other member state due to party political loyalty. And despite the local differences across the EU, it is clear to me, especially in times of economic difficulties, you should not restrict media channels, nor the information citizens can access through them. For example, to improve your conditions for re-election. Neither through laws, nor through a climate that induces self-censorship. Citizens need to know they can rely on unrestricted information to make good choices. And the third point is, that you can't ignore the reality of today's online world. <clears throat> Today, we have many different systems in place. For example, national regulators, which can be controversial for print media, are commonplace for audiovisual broadcasting. And yet, in a digital age, one clear distinctions are becoming blurred between print and broadcast, between organized media and occasional bloggers, between professional journalists and activist citizen, and any attempt to codify and protect media freedom and pluralism struggles to contain those shifting concepts. What do we even mean by media? The fact is, in an online world, content readily crosses sectorial boundaries and readily crosses national borders too. And because the digital transition is a challenge for some traditional media, I have created the Media Futures Forum, led by Christian Van Tilo, to discuss future-oriented solutions across the sector. And I 
highly recommend to read their report. It is about also new business models. Around 18 months ago, I asked another high-level group of experts to consider the issue of media freedom and pluralism. And I'm so glad that Hertha Deupler Menin, uh, one of the authors, is with us today and is joining the discussion. Their independent report made 30 recommendations to the EU, its member states, but also to media outlets and journalists themselves. And I will never forget, Hertha, our first meeting when we were sitting together <coughs> and that you and the chair of the high-level group was looking at me and saying, okay, you <coughs> want us to be active and prepare a report, but one requirement, don't ask for limitations. It is up to us. And I said, well, of course, for I asked those four high-level people, and then I shouldn't limit your, um, your way of uh, acting with those issues. And I'm still very, very impressed by what you produced at that time. Their ind independent report is really worthwhile to read, and I'm sure those recommendations, and some of them already attracted quite a considerable attention earlier this year, that um, list of recommendations will just be a big push forward, one way or another, but it will push forward the discussion in Europe, so to say. Um, some blatantly misrepresented the report, and I want to say that too, and that's also freedom, so to say. But please, if you are acting and reacting, just read the stuff and don't just misuse it in a way that is not based on facts and figures. So uh, the misrepresentation um, of some uh, of this report and said that the EU would seek the power to sack journalists. That's absolutely nonsense. But okay, that's also attracting attention and if that is stimulating the debate, come on, uh, let's go for it. But this is a comprehensive report raising many important and subtle ideas, like whether legislation should be used to protect journalistic sources. A very interesting suggestion and recommendation. But this is indeed the start of the discussion. Um, it is also about the role of journalistic standards. All areas where there is a <coughs> genuine debate to be had, let's drill down to that next level. And I realized that it is a sensitive area, no doubt about that. And I realized that views on those issues can be divided even within the sector itself. But that is exactly why I want to know your views and that I want to know the views of the journalists, of practitioners, of experts, and of the civil uh, people of all our citizens. Those of you who can carry out your job without interference or restriction, great. But those of you who don't feel so lucky, tell us why and what kind of action might change that. Let's be pragmatic, for it's not only talking about principles, it's also talking about the implementation of those values that we are so important in our list. And so today I announced the launch of two consultations on the recommendations of the high level group starting today for 12 weeks, you are asked to give input. The first looks at one specific issue in a field where the EU has already exercised its legislative competences. National regulatory authorities oversee audiovisual services under existing EU rules. We are asking whether and how to revise the EU law that applies to them, in particular to strengthen and to better guarantee their independence from governments. And in a second consultation, we are asking for views on each of the other recommendations of the group, whether you agree or disagree, or whether you have other ideas, 
this is your chance to say so and help shape the future of media policy. And that question of how we safeguard fundamental freedoms like media freedom, pluralism, is not an easy one to answer, but it is absolutely vital. It is so important and it's not going to go away. As the recent letter from four EU foreign ministers to President Barroso showed, some governments are concerned by the threats to our common values. And I call on all governments in the EU to take this <coughs> debate seriously. And why? In the interest of our citizens and ultimately in their own interest, in the base of uh, the democracy of Europe. But for all, that this is a complex question, for all that opinions may be polarized, we must find the right way forward for the sake of the European values, for the fundamental freedoms and the fabric of our own democracy. I will not shy away, Mr. Chair. I will not shy away from those difficult issues. And I'm determined to identify <clears throat> that way forward to take concrete action, if justified, before the end of my mandate. We still have time, one year and seven months, a lot can be done. The solution may lie <coughs> in action from the EU or member states, from the sector itself, or from a mix. But whatever the answer, I'm clear that freedom of speech is a fundamental EU value. And the EU has a duty. The duty is to ensure it is safeguarded. For how to best to do that, I turn to the journalism profession itself and those who cherish and protect its values. And by the way, this is a unique opportunity. It is a unique opportunity and it is a call to action to all of you. And I hope you will get that question, you will respond to that question, and I know you value media freedom and fear its loss. So tell me not just what the problems are, and I'm not saying that we are completely aware of all the problems, but anyhow, add to that uh, saying and telling, tell me the solutions. And the solutions are taken very seriously, and the sooner we are on the spot, the better it is for, I think, it is about credibility if we can act about something that is so important for our democracy. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice President.